Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the first three symphonies by Irvin Schulhoff. Schulhoff is a fascinating composer. I've really been, been dying to talk to you about him for a while now, but I wanted to find sort of the right entree, the right angle. Schulhoff's dates were 1895, 1894, pardon me, to 1942. He had his, his 15 minutes of fame maybe about a decade and a half ago in association with Decca's Antarctica Musik series. He wrote wonderful, wonderful music. He was one of those Jewish Czech composers who ultimately died of tuberculosis in a concentration camp during the Second World War when his music was relentlessly suppressed. He wrote six symphonies and a passel of chamber music, including two absolutely splendid string quartets and a bunch of other solo works, piano pieces, the opera Flamen, the ballet Ogallala. It's really just, just a good body of work for someone who died so young. He also did a lot of radio and popular music arrangements and whatnot. He was interested in expressionism, impressionism, jazz, communism, all of the isms. And his style evolved from a kind of, and it's hard to describe actually, kind of expressionist mixed with Czech folk elements kind of style to a very heavy duty socialist realist sort of factory music, march and mass protest kind of style. And that's quite evident in these three symphonies, actually, where you can hear him getting there, because each one is very different. And so I think really the best way to get into Schulhoff's music is to talk about these particular works. Symphonies numbers one through three. And here they are on CPO, where I can play samples, uh, with the Philharmonia Hungarica under Georg Alexander Albrecht. Very nicely performed and recorded. These works have not been performed frequently or recorded frequently. There were three recordings of number one. One was on Koch, one was on Superfon, and this one, which was actually the first to be released. The, the Superfon recordings are all out of print. There was a whole Schulhoff edition. And if anyone is listening at Superfon, you should take all your Schulhoff, stick it in a box, and reissue it. Number two is available on Orfeo and here and on Superfon and also also on Capriccio. It's been recorded the most frequently. The others basically have singleton one or two performances of each one, and they're a little bit harder to source. So this is really a good deal if you're going to get into Schulhoff. Each symphony has its own character, and what a wonderful character it is. Now, the first symphony is the earliest. It dates from 1925. And as I said, it's kind of a mixture of, of this sort of hallucinatory, um, you know, dreamlike quality, along with basically Czech folk music. You'll think at places you're listening to Janicek, at other places, it, it gets quite spacey. And it's marvelous, absolutely marvelous. It's an orchestra full of dance-like rhythms and percussive sonorities. It uses a flexitone. Have you seen a flexitone? You know, it's that, I have one in the, in the closet, but I, it's buried, I, my flexitone got buried, so I couldn't dig it out. But it, you know, you wiggle it, it goes like that. It's kind of like a musical saw, lots of fun. So I'm going to play you the opening of the first symphony so you get a sense of just what a fabulous mix of folk-like melody and exotic sonority it really is. Have a listen.
It's a fascinating work, isn't it? And the second symphony, um, which has four movements, includes a scherzo a la jazz. It dates from, oh my goodness, it's about 10 years later, uh, 1932, seven years later. And at this point, Schulhoff had gotten involved in popular music. He was hanging out in Berlin during the Weimar period and, you know, making arrangements of popular music for radio. And so he included a little tribute to jazz in the grotesque third movement of his second symphony. This is a lovely symphony, by the way. It's full of full of good tunes and characterful orchestration, but also with a touch still of that expressionistic kind of grotesquerie that we hear in his earlier works. It's, it's just marvelous. And here is a bit of the scherzo a la jazz from the second symphony. And last, but certainly not least, we get to the Third Symphony. Now, in the Third Symphony, uh, which is from 1935, Schulhoff had begun to uh, adopt a leftist communist um, ideology, and his music reflected that. It is music of mass protest, if you want to call that, but it's good music nonetheless. Um, as, as this style evolved, it got ever more ever more brash and sort of factory-like, kind of like Masolov's The Iron Foundry and other socialist realist pieces. The nice thing about Schulhoff, though, is that he's never, he's never windy. <laughs> he's never long-winded. He makes his points and then the music stops, which is really a good thing because a little of that stuff can go a long way. You know, one of his other big pieces, I have to tell you a story, he set as a cantata the Communist Manifesto he actually did that. And Superfon has a recording of it. And when I was doing, I was doing some work on, um, you know, putting together some reissue series for them back just after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of communism. And I was in Prague going through the archive, which was absolutely fascinating. And I came across the Communist Manifesto and I said to them, you know, this is really a historical document, this thing. Of course, it was able to be recorded back in the days when communism was the, th the thing in Eastern Europe, but they, they can't re-release it. They, they couldn't re-release it then because for political reasons, communism having just ended, the last thing they were going to do as a state enterprise, which they still were at the time, was to release a, a reissue, you know, lovingly remastered and annotated of Irvin Schulhoff's Communist Manifesto Cantata. I suppose perhaps they could do it now, but I don't even know if that's if that's in the cards politically, but they have it and it exists. And I'll bet it's a hoot. I mean, probably terrible, for, <laughs> you know, who knows? But I would like to hear it. I haven't heard it and I got, I got very, very curious about it. So there, there is this cantata out there, and it does exist, and maybe some year we will hear it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, with the Third Symphony, as you'll be able to hear from the finale, this is just, you know, it's a march. It's a march with a heroic tune, and a good tune it is. And this symphony is kind of interesting, because the first movement is just one giant crescendo that cuts off at the end. The finale is quite 
quite brooding and very, I mean, finale, I'm sorry, the slow movement is quite brooding and very disturbed. And the finale is this somewhat heroic march that, again, it's just seven or eight, six or seven minutes, eight minutes. How long is it here? Six minutes and 16 seconds. I can deal with six minutes and 16 seconds of National Socialist Folderol and Rah Rah fandom. And that's what this is. Anyway, here's the opening. A seriously fine composer, he wrote, um, and I, I just you know of all of those Antarctica Musik composers who, who Decca and other labels dug up a couple of decades ago when when all of that music was being rediscovered, Schulhoff was really one of the finest, and he's the one whose works really deserve to enter the repertoire. I mean, the chamber works really have. Um, that that's a good thing. You can find those pretty readily on on a variety of labels, and we'll talk about some of those too. But the symphonies and other orchestral pieces, they're still rarities, and few and far between. So I I do urge you to sample at least this disc on CPO. Again, it's uh, George Alexander Albrecht with the Philharmonia Hungarica, Schulhoff Symphonies One, Two, and Three. This is still available. Get it while you can. You won't be sorry. Keep on listening, folks. Take care. Thank you.